From the FJC in Washington, D.C., I'm Mark Sherman, and this is Off Paper. My guest is Wade Warren, retired Chief U.S. Probation and Pretrial Services Officer from the District of North Dakota. I'm talking with Wade today about the lasting impact he's been able to make in probation and pretrial services in areas like evidence-based practice and officer wellness. He spent 25 years in U.S. probation and pretrial services, beginning as a line officer in the District of Rhode Island, and is a recipient of the Director's Leadership Award, which is among the top honors given to court staff within the federal judiciary. The award acknowledged Chief Warren's leadership in a national effort to destigmatize officer stress and trauma and erode barriers to seeking help. Wade spearheaded the use of biofeedback, which was embedded in reality-based safety training and successfully advocated to include resilience as a core competency for probation and pretrial services officers. Wade Warren served 15 years as chief before retiring in October of last year. In addition to his work on evidence-based practice and officer wellness, Wade served on various local and national working groups and committees to include the Administrative Office's Chief's Advisory Group and the Indian Country Working Group and Steering Committee. He was also an instrumental member of the FJC's Advisory Committee on Probation and Pretrial Services Education. But the reason Wade is my guest has less to do with the quantity of his work than the quality of it. Wade Warren is one of those rare, visionary leaders able to leave his mark on this large and complex national system that is U.S. Probation and Pretrial Services. We benefit today from his work implementing evidence-based practice, raising the issue of officer wellness to one of national importance, and his push for a collaborative district culture. He is Exhibit A of a tough-as-nails leader who doesn't back down from a righteous fight, but who is, at the same time, a loving, kind, and caring person, a person not afraid to explore his own vulnerability and understand how that translates to courage. But there's more you should know about Wade. For 28 years, he served in the Army National Guard, retiring in 2010 at the rank of major after two commands and a deployment to Iraq as an intelligence officer with the 164th Combat Engineer Battalion. I'll talk to Wade about how his military experience changed him, how it influenced his work in probation and pretrial services, and how it led him to push for the lasting changes we all benefit from now. Wade Warren, that is quite a legacy, and I'm so excited to have this conversation with you. Welcome to Off Paper. Thank you, Mark. So I want to ask you first about the District of North Dakota's implementation of evidence-based practice, because you were kind of there from the beginning, and what you learned from leading that effort that can benefit folks in the system currently as they continue to implement evidence-based practice. One of the major things that we did, we had a partnership with the government of Saskatchewan, which uh, just proved to be um, very complimentary, very supportive, and and really helped us succeed um, at having kind of that international partnership with Dr. Rector, Delphine Gosner, and and their team. So we, we were fortunate to have a deputy who finished as a deputy. He was an officer then um, who kind of kind of set that whole thing up as a dual citizen, if you will, and and um, kind of helped us see that vision. And so we had some early success and then we hit sequestration. We hit an oil boom in North Dakota, um, a number of um, retirements, and and we, we had to really back off our plan for a number of years. 15 years later, although it took a long time, we did see some success, but there was a lot of sacrifice by a lot of people to make that all happen. This was all very experimental in the, the 2000s, the aughts, right? That's really when the system began to move forward and really implement, again, systemically evidence-based practice. And you were a pretty new chief still at the time. You had you had to learn the job, but you were also extremely innovative. The Canadian corrections systems community correction systems were fairly well ahead of the U.S. systems in the implementation of evidence-based practice. And so you created that strategic partnership in a very innovative way. What are some of the things you think 
chiefs and executive teams and management teams and probation and pretrial need to really be focusing on as we move to the next chapter in our system with evidence-based practice. I would really say that uh, implementation is a big part of what we do, even if you if you step outside of evidence-based practices, we're implementing things all the time um, at nationally, local level, regionally. And so I think those things can apply to anything we're doing. And um, I really was exposed to the more refined products of that before I retired and uh, really opened my eyes to a lot of things. And so I think the the implementation world in our business, it does uh, take a lot of bandwidth and I think it does cause a lot of organizational stress uh, within our organizations uh, locally and nationally. And so I think we can maybe cut some of that out by really paying attention to the science that is there and, and using that to help us uh, navigate forward. So Wade, you know, not to get into too much nerdiness about implementation science, but I think it would be helpful to differentiate between implementation science and evidence-based practice, whereas implementation science is a separate discipline that refers to really the implementation of any major organizational change, whether evidence-based practice or really anything else, but doing it in a sort of scientifically proven way that is systematic. And so I'm hoping you can describe a little bit about how that worked for you in the District of North Dakota. Implementation science has really uh, come a long way. It's, it's much more refined and really looks systemically at how to implement things from engagement to culture, to, to piloting, to the research and resourcing, and really sequencing those things in ways that have been studied be shown to be effective. And so uh, without giving a long litany of things and the, and the 10 or 12 steps, um, the beauty of it is now that it's so refined, it's made it a lot more easy to access and, and to use. I think it's helpful to think about, you know, what your organizational culture is like, and then the major sort of system change or organizational change you're trying to implement and how you're going to do that effectively. And, you know, with the with evidence-based practice, you know, that's deep culture change because now we're talking about as a system that every officer, pre-trial, pre-sentence, post-conviction supervision should see themselves as change agents through the use of evidence-based practice, which requires this major implementation across a very sophisticated and complex system. The beauty of implementation science and, and, and other things is it helps you really look at that culture now. Um, there's some tools available that can help you target some things and hopefully make some things easier. At the end of the day, it's still about um, working with people who have different philosophies, different ideas of what we should be doing, how we should be doing it, um, different views on science and and all those kinds of things. But what I will tell you is that, you know, after 15 years, we've seen um, pretty, pretty um, transformational movement. It's still what we refer to back in the day in the military as major muscle movements. So can I ask you if, if you can think of one example from your experience as chief in the District of North Dakota and the district's implementation of evidence-based practice that you thought went really well, uh, and then maybe one example of something that didn't go so well. And for each of those two things, you know, what was the key to, to, the, to the thing that went well, and what was the key to the thing that didn't go well that w would need to be fixed for the future? One of the, the decisions we, we had to make in working with Saskatchewan, so one of the things that went well um, in implementation uh, overall was implementing the PICRA into the PSI, which I think were one of the very few districts of, uh, out there that has a full spectrum risk assessment in the PSI and the PICRA itself. And so we have never been able to do that without the help of, of Canada. 
that went actually pretty well. And uh, that was like 2009 to 2011. Then we started to tackle uh, the supervision part. And that's when sequestration hit. We had uh, just quite a bit, and that's when we had a turn in our culture. And we had a a number of folks that were on the the heels of retiring. And we had the oil boom in North Dakota, which in the western and the Bakken region picked up a lot of federal prosecutions. And so not only was there sequestration, not only were we having a hard time finding people to fill those retirements, we had the workload uh, skyrocket. And so the supervision model in the beginning uh, did not go particularly well. We had to readjust and we eventually got our wheels back under us and then started to move on the supervision. But but those were kind of, those are maybe two areas, one that went well, one that didn't go so well. We had to kind of reboot and, and come back after it. All right. So th- that's very helpful. Thank you. And I think perhaps sort of the larger lesson for districts that are currently moving forward, you know, with the implementation of evidence-based practice is, yes, we want to move forward with that. Yes, to the degree you can use the principles of implementation science to do that, you should do that. However, that doesn't mean that you aren't going to have to adjust and readjust your plan for circumstances that may arise that were really perhaps not even possible to plan for. The other lesson here is that this is something that you really do need to take the long view on. But if you do put a lot of effort and investment into the planning process um, and you use the principles of implementation science, which our system is now beginning to do, you can make a lot of headway, but keep your expectations reasonable. We, we had some subject matter experts, you know, in our system um, that uh, at the AO and Melissa Alexander, implementation science, but we also had Canada working for us who had a pretty good handle on it. So those kind of things were really, were really valuable. This is Off Paper. I'm Mark Sherman, and I'm talking with Chief U.S. Probation and Pretrial Services Officer Wade Warren of North Dakota. Wade retired in 2021 after leading the district for 15 years. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, Wade and I will discuss his efforts to forge a national movement for officer wellness. Stay with us. How are you managing your health and wellness during this pandemic? And does that question itself stress you out? I'm Jennifer Richter, host of a new podcast episode for improving mental health, increasing personal and professional productivity, and fostering happiness in yourself and those around you. In this episode, I talk with two experts about actionable steps we can all take to face our challenges head on and to achieve a better sense of balance. You can find this episode managing our health and wellness during COVID-19 and beyond on the COVID-19 educational resources page on fjc.dcn. Or if you subscribe to Off Paper through your podcast provider, you'll find it listed as a special bonus episode. It can be a chance to reset, rethink, and retool our coping strategies and to refocus on what matters most. Give it a listen. It might just make your day. So, Wade, I mentioned earlier that you received the AO Director's Award in 2019 for your efforts on officer wellness. You'd been working on that issue almost from the time you became chief and kind of before it was cool in our system to do so. As we know, officers engage in a combination of law enforcement and social work, but the law enforcement culture tends to dominate when it comes to issues of officer health, especially mental health which can make it extremely difficult for officers to get the help they need or even to acknowledge that they might need help. Over the past few years, we've experienced several officers taking their own lives. And on a regular basis, officers are exposed to trauma of all kinds. It's just the nature of the job. So I want to ask you about your work on officer wellness, and especially I want to ask you about your own health struggles as both an officer and a soldier and how that informed your thinking about what probation and pre-child services officers need. Sure. Thanks, Mark. The, the first thing I'd, I'd like to say is that uh, 
we had a lot of people involved in this uh, wellness movement. I had some people uh, holding down the fort a lot when I was kind of focused on some of this stuff on a national level. So that's the first thing that I want to say. So I had a lot of help there, obviously from my, from my family, from a lot of other people that were very supportive. The combat deployment was really about a three-year period, a year of train up, but about a year actual deployment, pre-deployment down in Mississippi, then in Iraq, and then coming home. And so, you know, things largely went well, but, but uh, there's a lot of settling there and there's a lot of carryover stuff from, from the accumulated stress and being away from family, from all the things you experience in country and otherwise. And then, you know, not too long after I got home, then my wife um, had breast cancer. And so, and then we went into a really, a, what I would say a high tempo period in our district with a lot of these things that I mentioned earlier. So the result of that was that, uh, you know, it had a, had a pretty big effect on me and I really didn't kind of get a, as good a handle on that as I needed to until a couple of years later when I started to, to really look at improving my overall wellness and dealing with, with some of that stuff. And, and, um, you know, working with the vet center on some things that, that really kind of opened my eyes. And, and then, you know, the person I worked with there really encouraged me to, to go out and speak about my experience. And so it took me a while to do that. So, um, but I had a lot of very supportive people along the way. And, and, uh, you know, I, I think as I, I went along, you really start to see how all these, these challenges that we have are really opportunities for growth um, if you if you choose to, to look at it like that. And so in the end, that's what I tried to do. It took a while and took quite a bit of work, but it was very helpful to uh, travel that journey. So you were dealing with a lot. And I guess I just want to ask you, like, at what point did you realize, you know, you needed you needed help? I had a very good friend, uh, still a good friend that I deployed with. We were goose hunting. And as we sat and we chatted, he just kind of looked at me and said, you know, you're starting to sound a lot like I used to. You really, I, I think maybe you should go to the vet center. And, uh, and that really took me back uh, a bit. But then we talked some more. And so, you know, um, and I had a really good experience there. I had a really good social worker. But I had also done a lot of things. Uh, for myself, for my own wellness along the way that were very helpful. And that's one of the things she wanted me to talk about is how beneficial that actually was. And so the piece that I, I, I didn't do in there is, is uh, the, the part that we don't want to do, right? And go and get help. It's like just getting a, 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 having someone help you try on different lenses to see things in different ways, you know, and, uh, and so that was really helpful. So what do you think your friend meant by you're, you're sounding like I used to before I got help? So what, what do you think he meant by that? Well, yeah, I think he, he, he was basically saying, look, you know, I, I needed to get help. And uh, I essentially had told him that a couple of years earlier. And uh, really, he's just being a really good friend. And, and he's yeah. actually helped a whole lot of people. Um, uh, on the military side, even though he's retired. And so uh, very well respected. And so, so I think that's what he meant is luck. There's a better way to do this. You don't need to carry, you know, whatever it is. Uh, it's, it's uh, something that you can progress into a better place with and, and you live more satisfactorily and you don't have to, uh, so you don't have to carry this stuff around. How were you feeling, if you can recall, at that time? Like, what was, like, eating at you? And, I, I, I mean, like, what were the signs to you that your friend helped you acknowledge, you know, that indicated, yeah, it's time for me to, to get some. Yeah. I think what he recognized the most is this kind of this, this uh, negative thinking cycle. And uh, he just kind of said, I, he, he also said in that moment, I, I never really thought I'd have to say this to you, you know, so um, that really stepped me back. So what were some of those preventative things that you had done that you may not have even sort of 
been consciously thinking about as preventative things, but, but seemed to work out that way. Physical fitness was big, um, but uh, the heart rate variability um, work. I had a really good support network of chiefs out there. Work on your marriage and try not to let that get degraded. Uh, deep spiritual work I did as well. And those things um, were obviously very helpful. How did that change you as a chief? Uh, motivate you to sort of raise these issues of officer health and wellness to make some changes? I think as I went through this work, I, I grew a lot and and I, I think it helped me become a better leader and to really look at things differently. You know, one of the things I've mentioned to you is that uh, I, I got involved with the Arbinger Institute, the Outward Mindset Program as well. And that that was foundational in terms of um, not just for myself, I think it had some it, it, it added to our district as well over time, but just really, uh, you know, the way that uh, you look at how you impact other people by your own behavior um, and how you see people as people and not as objects and, and, and or as a vehicle to get somewhere. As far as getting out and and speaking, I think, you know, I, I describe it a little bit as a calling. Um, yeah, you just, uh, and I'm a private guy. And so it took a while to do that. But, uh, you know, uh, once you kind of, you kind of get out, uh, out in front of this, uh, and you're, you get a little more comfortable with speaking in front of people about such a private issue and one that we generally don't talk about in this field. I got a lot of people reaching out to me, even on the side about different issues they're having and, and that kind of thing. And so um, that was particularly rewarding. One of the things that is very concrete that you did, sort of based on what you've learned from this part of your life, you know, was, you know, you were part of our advisory committee on probation and pretrial services education at the time when the Federal Judicial Center was developing sets of competencies. And at one point, you insisted that looking at the competencies, you were like, how come we don't have anything in here about officer wellness as a competency? And, and everybody was kind of struck by that question. And there were a couple of other members of the committee from the academy and other chiefs and other members of the committee who were like, yeah, why don't we have something in here as a competency, like to re sort of require officers to, you know, take affirmative steps toward their own health and wellness. And that's sort of how we came up with the concept of resilience or the competency of resilience, which is now part of the 10 competencies for U.S. probation and pretrial services officers. That was an, an amazing contribution, Wade. And I'm, in addition to that, you know, what were some of the other things that you felt needed to happen that actually did happen as a result of what you learned about the importance of taking care of yourself as an officer, as a chief, as an executive within the courts, uniquely working within probation and pretrial? I had an opportunity within the HRV field in working with the University of Toronto and connecting with them to, to bring uh, HRV into uh, reality-based scenarios and kind of work with heart rate variability uh, with officers in, in a number of settings and a number of districts and along with a lot of people. And so, um, you know, newer concept uh, in that way. And so that, that is something that we, we did get some traction on that was, that was rewarding. And as Jean D Maria used to say, Hey, we got to work on our internal skill sets. And, uh, you know, we have all these external skills. Uh, if you're in the safety arena, all these different things that we can use, but how good are they if our internal skill sets aren't where they need to be? And, one of the key pieces that, that may be forgotten is you know, the wellness committee was moved um, to uh, the academy under Ron Ward, which gave us a budget. And, and Ron was fantastic and really kind of reconstituting the wellness team. And so I, what I would finish with is that, look, it's hard to have an infinite mindset uh, when, when, when 
over the long haul. But those kinds of things, I think, are really important to to do what you can to kind of stay in the game and uh, stay persistent. And uh, and a lot of for me, I had a lot of people helping me with that to to do that as a chief. So when you're talking about internal skill sets, right? Which is an interesting and great way to think about it, especially in probation and pretrial and really any public safety profession, because there is such an emphasis on the external and the importance of external skill sets. To me, that translates as, you know, self-awareness, emotional intelligence, honesty with yourself, and being able to reveal who you are in ways where staff can sort of know that it's safe and okay for them to explore those areas too. And in fact, not safe, not just okay, but like essential. Really, your work uh, on health and wellness in probation and pretrial has been about transforming that part of at least the probation and pretrial law enforcement culture away and toward something more hospitable to developing those internal skill sets. And it isn't just in probation, you know, since I've retired, I've been able to connect with some recently retired uh, FBI agents that, uh, you know, they are very like-minded in these things that we're talking about here. And uh, so, but I think law enforcement, military, things are changing. It's slow to change, but I think you're going to see uh, a much more adaptable workforce in this way. You know, we've talked about some of Brene Brown's work in and around courage and risk and vulnerability, which is really revolutionary. And I think the work with her and others that are doing like-minded things are going to be very helpful in kind of moving the field to a better place. Well, you know, I do thank you so much for mentioning Brene Brown because she's a remarkable researcher and practitioner and she has uh, at least one, perhaps more terrific TED Talks and multiple interviews where she talks about the power of vulnerability and that vulnerability, as as you and I have discussed in the past, Wade, is, is a form of courage and very, very important for leaders and for law enforcement officers and really all professionals and folks to be aware of and to embrace. So I appreciate your mentioning that. And, um, you know, to be continued, the conversation about wellness, but the, the, the work that you've done on that subject matter, certainly deserving of the director's award and, you know, now very much a, a national priority for federal probation and pretrial is really quite something. I'm talking with Wade Warren, the recently retired Chief U.S. Probation and Pretrial Services Officer from the District of North Dakota, about his experience serving that district and his contributions as a leader to the federal judiciary. We're going to take another break. When we return, Wade and I will wrap up our conversation by talking about his role in helping to create a more collaborative culture in both North Dakota's Federal Probation and Pretrial Services Office and the court more generally. Back in a moment. Hi, I'm Lori Murphy, a colleague of Mark Sherman and head of the Executive Education Group at the FJC. We have a podcast that focuses on leadership in the federal courts called In Session, Leading the Judiciary, that I think you'll like. Each episode features current research and cutting-edge insights into leadership. Guests include Michael Lewis, groundbreaking author of The Undoing Project and Moneyball. Professor Jennifer Eberhardt, implicit bias researcher at Stanford University, and Harvard Business School's expert on psychological safety, Amy Edmondson. Each episode strives to enhance listeners' critical thinking skills, encourage expression of authentic leadership, and promote the use of best practices among judiciary executives. Episodes are available wherever you get your podcasts or on fjc.dcn. Join us. The podcast is... In session, leading the judiciary. Wade, I know you're an avid student of leadership and you've spent quite a lot of time studying leadership with the FJC, with the Army, and with places like the Arbinger Institute, which you've mentioned, the HeartMath Institute, and a number of other highly regarded organizations. 
I also know that you're quite proud of the work that you did in the District of North Dakota in helping both the Probation and Pretrial Services Office and the court evolve in terms of what we refer to as organizational culture. So describe what it looked like more specifically in 2006, and then what it looked like in terms of the organizational culture when you left, when you retired in 2021. Contrast those two things for us to kind of like paint the picture for, for the audience. Literally a couple of weeks after I was appointed as chief, the R to our solicitation came out. Culture-wise, we needed to develop a culture that was supportive and embedded in that idea of evidence-based movement. And there were a lot of people there to help as I left and handed things off um, for about a year and then came back. And so I would I would say, Mark, the culture there now uh, in the district even nationally has changed in terms of using tools and uh, whether albeit evidence-based or safety tools. I think, you know, that idea of traditional, we had been doing things a certain way for a long time and it took a while to, to kind of move the spectrum on the evidence-based platform, if you will. Probably a, a more of a, a little more of a uh, transformational organization in terms of looking at the tools that we have to use, this idea of team effort, um, true team effort. I think there's been a lot of movement over the last 15 years. And and I think um, Bill and and Mike and the leadership team, including the, the, the support services leaders and the specialists, um, they're, they're really talented folks and really uh, mission oriented. So it'll be, it'll be neat to see where it goes from here. Everything you're saying to me makes sense and applies really across the probation and pre-child services system, at least the federal system. 10, 15 years ago, much more traditional, meaning hierarchical, sort of more command and control. You can't work that way if you're implementing evidence-based practice. It has to be much more collaborative within Clearly, your district has served, has been a leader in, in, in moving from that more traditional, static, hierarchical way of doing things as an organization and certainly as a quasi-law enforcement organization to a much more team-oriented, collaborative style. So I wonder if you could kind of drill down on that because, you know, that's not necessarily how people view leaders. You know, we tend to have a more traditional view, which doesn't really correspond with how we want organizations to behave and operate in 2022 and beyond. Something that really resonated with me and we had some success with it. We probably didn't um, do this very well in the beginning, but and this idea of growing accountability versus holding people accountable. Now, certainly you have to hold people accountable, but I think uh, there's an effort within that movement to to grow accountability within a unit within our agency. That supervisor uh, has a, a fair amount of autonomy in working with their unit um, to get the job done, and um, you know that's that's a give and take always. Um, but uh, to give them some space to operate. And that's something that, that Mike and I did a lot of work on. Uh, he did a really nice um, job in the last couple of years as I worked more kind of nationally, kind of developing, um, and this is not our term, it probably comes out of General McChrystal's world, a team of teams kind of thinking. And, um, and, and he, he took that and just kind of ran with it and he developed some pretty neat teams, small independent teams that were working collaboratively within the district, you know, whatever it might be, the location monitoring, supervision, PSI, uh, pretrial, um, you know, uh, DATS, and, and um, really did some creative work and, and some um, really developed a, a skill set of his. So you know, that, that was really kind of neat to watch and, and, uh, and to be involved in that. So 
I think those things are really important, but I, within that is, you know, you have to also have the support of your judicial officer, your chief judge to be, to do that so that uh, the supervisor of the PSI team can take the lead on going to meet with the chief judge on an issue. And it doesn't always have to be the chief there. Some people wouldn't agree, agree with that, but I think there's some real growth opportunity there. Um, and so those are some things, I mean, uh, you know, pre pandemic, we wanted to expand telework. Uh, the folks were asking for that, uh, for the trust to, well, the pandemic put us in that spot. Um, and, and I think by and large, we found that, Hey, look, uh, we hired these folks at a very high level with a, you know, all the background checks and all the things that we do and they do it through OPM. Um, you know, high level of trust, get the job done, give you some more flexibility. We had some success with that stuff. And I think a lot of districts did and wherever it goes from here, I think that some of that will stay in place and some districts will use it more, some will use it less, but I think that's maybe an example of that as well. It's a fantastic example, Wade. I just love the term growing accountability versus holding people accountable. Um, I, 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 because I think that sort of describes sort of what the expectation of staff should be, right? What, you know, that the leadership of the organization should, it's reasonable for them to expect staff to be accountable and for staff to understand what that means because they have a stake in the organization and a stake in the job and that you orient the practices within the organization to encourage that, as you've described so well, that you and Mike McGrath did in in the District of North Dakota, you know, and at the end of the day, it makes the leader's job, whether it's the supervisor of the unit, the deputy chief, the chief, it makes your job so much easier, right? Because you don't have to be at every meeting with the judicial officer, with the judge, you know, on a pre-sentence report. Like you can trust, you know, the the unit, the pre-sentence unit to conduct those meetings without you being there as the chief or in, in many other respects, as you've described. So, you know, but that's a different mindset. That's a different approach to leadership. That's a different approach to thinking about what how an organization should operate. So extremely helpful to think about it in that way, because I think, again, in the more traditional organization, you know, it's like the holding people accountable is about submitting your reports on time and checking those boxes and having those kinds of conversations rather than, you know, how's it going with this person you're supervising and sort of taking a much more mentoring and coaching approach as a manager or a leader with staff and with staff kind of seeking out that kind of support rather than being worried, oh, am I submitting that report on time and I'm going to get dinged if I don't, you know, where they know they need to submit the thing on time and if it's going to be an issue, they work it out with their supervisor to make sure that the court is getting what it needs and, and that the clients are getting what they need. So any final thoughts or reactions to that before we wrap it up? No, just that, you know this, Mark, that uh, it, it I'm retired, so it might sound a lot easier than it is. It's, it's, it's look, it's messy and, and uh, not in intentional ways, but it's, it's leadership across all these things that are trying to be done. And we have a lot of good people that are very uh, conscientious, very passionate, very talented. And um, I, I think uh, what I left with is that uh, that system is in good hands and it'll be fun to watch it go down the road. And I, I kind of, um, you know, for me, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, and I'm using General McChrystal a little bit, you know, he's a ranger. So part of the ranger creed is to do your share of the task. So that's what we're supposed to do. Try to do your share of the task here. And it isn't going to be perfect. And it isn't always going to look nice. But uh, just put your best foot forward and uh, grow and, and keep the interest of the people. But in the middle of that is a lot of critics, right? It just is. I mean, it's a critical world to begin with. And, uh, and so, you know, that, that kind of stuff, uh, you much like the learning to be 
becoming comfortable with being uncomfortable. It's also that it's not that you don't care what other people think. You just can't let those things stop you from, from doing the conscientious, reasonable things that you're, you need to do as a leader. And, and, um, you know, but it's still a tough, it's a good run. It's a good career, but it's, uh, there's a lot of requirements there for officers, for support staff, for chiefs, deputies and the like. And, um, but like I said, when I left, they said the system's in good hands. And so, um, it, uh, it, it's time to move on. And, and I've, I've done that. I, I didn't uh, foresee myself really not working the first six, seven months of, of retirement. Um, but, but that's been a good thing. And now I'm ready maybe to do a little bit of work and in different ways. So, well, Wade Warren, congratulations on a brilliant career in U.S. probation and pretrial services. And for everything you've contributed over the years to both the federal judiciary and your country. It's just, and on a personal note, it's just been a, a great pleasure to work with you over those years. We've worked together for a long time on many different projects, and it's just been a very enriching and rewarding experience for me. So I just want to thank you for that and uh, wish you all good things in this next chapter for you. Yeah, and I, I would say the same, Mark. I've, I've been, uh, enjoyed certainly my friendship and colleagueship with you and the FJC and, and the incredible role that you have in us doing our business it uh while a smaller force you serve a really uh important role and you perform that uh, very well so i i and i think most chiefs would would echo that with the fjc you know i've, I've had great experiences across the board with pso and and the like but i've really enjoyed working at the fjc with you and others thank you wade appreciate you man Right back at you. Off Paper is produced by Shelley Easter. The program is directed by Craig Bowden. Our program coordinator is Anna Glochkova. Don't forget, folks, you can subscribe to Off Paper on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, or pretty much wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Mark Sherman. Thanks for listening. See you next time. This podcast was produced at U.S. taxpayer expense.